You're going to learn all about how you're going to be able to customize AWS services for uh, compliance and auditing. And um, I'll do a quick round of intros for everybody. So I'm, I'm Brad Gilman. I am the uh, global principal specialist for our cloud ops group. I focus on services uh, in our compliance and auditing uh, area. With me, I've got Suchita Verma. She is the CloudTrail uh, product manager. And we've also got a customer, Todd Snyder, from Arctic Wolf that is going to be uh, talking today. And so some of the things, just to set the stage of what we're going to be covering, we're going to be focusing on things like what he does and a day in a life that he has, um, some of the challenges that he faces, some of the challenges that we see other customers facing. And we're going to go through various services that help customers meet those challenges. And what we're also going to discuss is how our customers customize these services to meet their needs. Because not everything works just perfectly right out of the box. And sometimes there's some tune, tunables that you want to go in and set. So we're going to discuss a lot of those. And then we're going to jump into how Todd has used our services to solve some of the challenges that he's faced. And then, not on here, but we're also going to do a, a quick round of demos. We have a couple of new releases that we've done here at reInvent we're going to include as well. And we'll end it up with some resources that are going to help you, um, you know, take what you've learned today and go back and use them yourself. All right, so Todd, why don't you tell us, uh, you know, what does Arctic Wolf do? Um, Arctic Wolf is a leader in security operations. Uh, we protect over 4,600 organizations globally from cyber threats. And uh, the way we do that, uh, we kind of operate across three domains. We have hardware sensors um, and scanners we put in our customers' networks. They monitor traffic that comes and goes through the network, um, and they'll send back security data to our back end. So we ingest a lot of data that way. We also work across multiple clouds ingesting security data uh, from, those, from those and bring them also back into the back end. Um, and finally, we ingest data from hundreds of third parties um, and, and through uh, partner integrations and things like that, we're also ingesting data. So we bring in a whole lot of data to the total of around four and a half trillion events per day. Uh, we use 60 AWS services, five regions, over 100 accounts. Um, and it's a lot of data and a lot of services we need to make sure that we're protecting. All right, and so uh, that's awesome. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what you do at Arctic Wolf? I protect customer data, as I just said. Um, my team is responsible for security of the cloud and in the cloud. So we kind of take the, the handoff from the shared responsibility model and make sure that we're building an environment that our developers and our data scientists and our engineers and our, our AI people, and everyone has a secure workspace um, for working in the cloud, that they're not doing things they're not supposed to do. We're trying to build paved paths um, along with our infrastructure teams and our DevX teams to make sure that they all have ways to do things properly. Um, so we manage all the core AWS security services, things like CloudTrail and Config and Security Hub and Access Analyzer, um, and make sure that we're providing that data to everybody um, in the best way possible and that we're consuming that data and acting on things that we see from it. Um, and finally, we're responsible for all the access control in AWS, and that's a really short sentence, and it's a whole lot of work, managing IAM for hundreds of developers, multiple teams, multiple services, as well as managing the access that those services have to other services and things like that within AWS, so managing service level accounts and that. So we're responsible for all of that as well. Awesome, man. So um, why don't you uh, go through a few of the challenges that you all have? Sure. Yeah, Arctic Wolf has been growing. Uh, in my time that I've been there, uh, we've doubled and we've doubled again. Um, and alongside the doubling in customers and staff and everything like that, and data, more than doubling on data, uh, our infrastructure is going to support it. We've gone from one to five different geographic regions in that time. We've grown from, uh, I can't remember what the numbers are, but up to over 100 AWS accounts. Um, and so at, um, at the same time we're growing, Amazon's growing. It's launching new services. It's launching new features. And we're having a real struggle trying to keep up with the, the rate of change, the pace of change, and making sure that we're able to enable all the security tools and things like that quickly. I mean, this week alone, I've opened a dozen JIRA tickets with new features saying, hey, we should look at this, hey, we should look at this, hey, we should look at this. And it takes time for my team to work through all that, right? Um, and we also struggle with the, uh, the, the volume and velocity of security data. So in the last little while, we've been turning on and managing more AWS security features and more, more services. And we've realized it's kind of turned into like a capital B, capital B, a D, big data problem, where we're dealing with terabytes of data a day, and we need to be able to tackle that. Um, and make sure that everything is done consistently across the board, but with all the little nuances that come with growing as well. So we have now different tiers of accounts. We have production and non-production accounts. We have product and non-product accounts. We have InfoSec accounts and marketing accounts. And some of them have different things we need to do in them. And so it's the whole matrix of all the things we do are, are our challenges. It's getting everything right all the time. Um, so my kind of, my happy place, my goal for this, um, as we work through all this, is to have a real centralized place to deploy org-wide solutions 
uh, for compliance and security so that we know that we're doing things consistently right. Uh, we took a bit of a veer into Terraform and started doing a bunch of work with that to do uh, deployment of tools, and then we realized stack sets are still a great way to do things because they work and they understand organizations. So we've, that's one of the examples where we've kind of gone one way is we shifted back to uh, other tools. Um, we need to get the information uh, that we need, sorry, I need to get the information and get it to the right people when we need it uh, at an organization or an individual account level or in groups of accounts. Um, and I really want to democratize the security and compliance data. So making it available to all the right people, whether it's developers to understand what's going on and what they're doing when they're building new services or to our COGS people or to our security people. Um, and so it's, it's managing all those different pieces together. But I don't really think those are challenges that are just limited to Arctic Wolf. Um, there's got to be other customers that are having the same issues. What are they telling you, Brad and Suchita? Yeah, definitely. So um, we do have a lot of customer challenges that we, we hear from people. and so. One of the things that we find is that customers are looking to simplify their deployment across their organization. They're looking to adhere to security and compliance best practices, and they want to do it all cost effectively. And so, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how you all can do this for you in your organizations. And so, what I'd like to do is kind of set the stage here on how we look at this uh, for, at AWS. And what we've done is we've aligned our services into the, um, the internal audit, um, sorry, the Institute of Internal Auditors three lines of defense model. And for this, what we've done is we've aligned each one of our services into a, a specific portion of the defense model. The first one is gonna be where you're gonna be enabling controls to reduce your risk. And so you're gonna start off with AWS Control Tower to be to be the governance portion and to be vending of all of your accounts. And then in there, we've also got AWS Backup. And so AWS Backup is where you're gonna be keeping all your backups to ensure that you've, you've got copies of everything that you need. And lastly, in this line, we've got AWS Config. We're gonna talk extensively about Config here in a second. And then the next line of defense is where you're gonna be assessing your risk. And so services in there are gonna typically gonna include uh, Systems Manager and Primarily for Systems Manager to be in there, it's because it is gonna provide us with the ability to do remediations, so it's a very powerful tool. And then Security Hub is gonna be one of the other big services in this realm. Uh, Security Hub, in general, is gonna give you this really nice single pane of glass, and it's not only gonna be showing findings from AWS services, but also services that have um, inter or capabilities to send their data into their third parties and whatnot. The last line of defense and where we've got other services is gonna be the internal audit line. And so inside of here, we've got services like AWS Audit Manager and AWS CloudTrail. And so this is where you're gonna get that evidence and those logs that you require for your auditing. And then that's where you're gonna be able to then provide that data over to your external auditors. And so what we wanna focus here is we're gonna kind of walk through each one of these customer challenges in the services and how they line into them. And so we're gonna start off with the simplified deployment across organizations. And so for this is where we're gonna see the AWS Control Tower. And so this offers just a very straightforward way to set up and govern your multi-account environment following prescriptive best practices. And so what Control Tower is gonna do is it's gonna orchestrate the capabilities of several different services on your behalf to build landing zone in under an hour. Some of these services are gonna include things like CloudTrail, Config, IAM, organizations, and we also now have a new integration with Security Hub. And so then some of the features, I'm not gonna dive into all of them, but some of the features are gonna be things like the dashboard capabilities of Control Tower, which is gonna give you continuous oversight into your environment, and you're gonna get visibility into all those provisioned accounts. It, the dashboard's gonna provide you reports on how your controls, either prescriptive or detective, if, you know, with the resources, are we compliant or not in one nice spot? So it works out pretty well there. Um, one of the other big features that Control Tower does is it's gonna detect drift. So if all of a sudden accounts are not in line with where they're supposed to be, we're gonna be able to get them back into place for you. And as you can see, there's a lot of other features. We're not gonna dive too deep into that. Instead, what we wanna do is we kinda wanna talk about how we see customers customizing Control Tower and some of those features that they're doing. First is gonna be regions. And so this is one of those things where you know, we want customers to go in and, and customize Control Tower to um, manage the regions that they're running in, and then you know we offer this capability of region deny, where if you wanna keep your users out of those regions, you'll go in and put that to keep people out of that. The next area that we see a lot of customers doing customizations is gonna be in the security and compliance controls. And this is where Control Tower really shines. And so inside of here, you're gonna have the ability to deploy SCPs, 
Um, you're going to be able to do things like security hub rules and config rules. There's a, a really nice dashboard now where you can actually go in and select which ones you're wanting to, to deploy as optional controls. And these will now, through an integration with Security Hub, will show up inside of Security Hub as a, uh, a control set that exists inside of there. And then you can get things like scores and whatnot against how you're doing. So it's kind of like you build your own security posture. And so that's one of the customizations we're seeing a lot there. Um, and then the last thing that we've recently added inside of Control Tower is going to be the preventative controls, and so uh, our proactive controls, sorry. And the proactive controls, an example would be something like um, ensuring that rotation is on all of your KMS keys. So there's, there's some really powerful tools inside of there to, to help customize control tower in your deployment. The, the last area on control tower that we'll talk about customizing is gonna be logging. And so this is one of the items where things like your, your cloud trail logs, when we came up with the latest release of control tower, it now is gonna give you the capability to either select, do I want Control Tower to manage my logs for me? And so then that's gonna be an organization-wide trail. Or the customers, a lot of them we've heard, they, they don't want that. They wanna do their self-managed trails. So that's gonna be one of those options that you'll be able to select. And so now I'm gonna jump over into the services that we, um, the customers are using to adhere to the security and compliance best practices. And inside of this area, we've got three services we're gonna talk about today. Um, AWS Config, AWS Audit Manager, and CloudTrail. So AWS Config, um, AWS Config, think of it as kind of like a Swiss Army knife of AWS. And this service, what it does under the covers is it is tracking all of the resources that are supported for change. And so when it detects a change in a resource, it is going to then create what is called a configuration item. And that configuration item is gonna contain all of the various data of what the resource in its status is at that moment. So that's the first construct of config. And it's the extremely super powerful um, construct where it's gonna be tracking all this for you. And kind of think of it as like a cloud CMDB where you're gonna have access to view all of those resources. And then the next line of config that, or the next piece of config is gonna be our rule engine. And so what the rule engine is gonna let you do as a customer is you're gonna be able to go in and say, you know, you, well, you can use our pre-baked ones, um, things like, um, you know, is there S3 access to the world? Um, is port 22 blocked uh, on a security group? And so these, what's gonna do is it's gonna track those resources, it's gonna see if, a, if the resource is compliant or not, it's gonna report back to you. And so super, super powerful there. The last construct of config is gonna be what are called conformance packs. And so what these are is, it's a collection of config rules that adhere or will help you adhere to industry standards such as NIST or HIPAA or PCI. And so what's, what's really nice about these is we've gone ahead and done all the documentation for you. So we've broken out the various controls for each one of those frameworks and we've mapped the various rules to them. So you'll be able to very easily go in and, and get a, a good stance on you know, what your posture is. It's still, of course, on the customer to, to look at the controls and verify, you know, am I NIST or am I PCI? But we're at least giving you that capability to kind of help you jump into it. And so as far as customizations for config, this is, this is again, like I said, it's a Swiss Army knife. And so config, the first area we'll talk about is custom resources. So if it's a resource that you're wanting to track and config doesn't currently have support for it, you have the capability as a customer to go in and add that capability yourself. And so um, what we've seen some customers do, they can use um, the CloudFormation registry and be able to build out custom resources. Um, we are continuously adding more and more, as everyone's probably seen. We're adding anywhere between 20 and 30 new resource types a month. So, and we're gonna continue to do that, of course. But the other part where this is really powerful is, let's say that you are a multi-cloud customer. And so we've got a customer, Deutsche Borsa, that what they do, we have a, a whole case study on this, but they have taken config with its ability to do custom resources, and they've built out those custom resources that are tracking resources over in the other clouds. And so then now they've got a single central pane of glass inside of config where they can run evaluations where they've built custom rules to be able to look at those custom resources and give them their security posture. So it, extremely powerful in that sense. Um, and that leads me right into custom rules. And so custom rules is, is one of these areas where I see a lot of customers going in and building out, say, to meet their needs. Like say the business decides we want everything encrypted at rest. And it may be, you know, 
an area that we don't have a, a pre-built rule for you. And so this gives you the capability to go in and do that. And um, one of the really nice things here with, with custom rules is recently with um, Amazon Code Whisperer, they have the ability to support the language that we are using for our custom rule engine, which is going to be CFN guard DSL language. So um, we've actually got a session, I think tomorrow or maybe this afternoon, here at, uh, at reInvent where we're going to show how you can go in with natural language into Code Whisperer and have it write a rule for you. And so what this is really doing is it's removing that barrier where you don't have to know how to code to be able to do those rules. And it's using that CFN guard language. And one of the nice things with CFN guard, this is something we released last year, is instead of now having to do your rules inside of Lambda where you may have like a code block that's this long, in CFN guard now it may be four or five lines. So it's a, a greatly simplified. And now with Code Whisperer, it's really making it super easy for you to be able to write your own custom rules. Um, and then the next area that we're seeing customers customize things is going to be conformance packs. And so conformance packs, as I was talking about earlier, we've kind of lined them up to the various industry standards, but they're templates. We want you to go into the code. We, we provide you with the YAML, and we want you to go in there, and if there's things that the business doesn't care about, go in and remove it. You know, there's no reason to be doing extra rule evaluations, costing money when you don't need to. So by all means, we want you to do that. And then, like, for example, let's say if you're a company that's got payment card processing, so you're needing PCI DSS, but you also want to be NIST 853 revision 4 or revision 5, you could take those two YAML sets and be able to, in essence, do a dedupe where you're only going to be doing one set of rule evaluations, which, again, is going to be helping you run cost effective. And lastly, this is, uh, this is actually something we've added recently. And so up until recently, if you wanted to have historical data in, of config, you had to kind of do a heavy lift because what we were doing is we were giving the snapshots to you in S3, and then you'd have to take those and do an ETL and be able to get them over into Athena or any of your own sims or whatnot, and it could be a little bit of a pain. And so what we've done, and Suchito will probably talk about it a little bit later and maybe show it in a demo, but we are now giving you an easy button. So you can literally go into CloudTrail Lake and just say, I want to do an EDS store for configuration items, and then it's all there. And super simple, makes it really easy for you to be able to, um, to look through your config items. And the next service that we were going to talk about was going to be AWS Audit Manager. So Audit Manager is something that's going to simplify how you manage risk and compliance across your, uh, your, your accounts, adhering to industry standards and regulations. And so where Audit Manager is super powerful is like, for example, if you uh, need to adhere to SOC 2, and which a lot of us, if we're running in the, in, on the cloud, need to adhere to SOC 2. And so that's one of the frameworks that we've got in there. And so you can go in there and you can select that framework. And then what Audit Manager is going to do is it's going to provide you with every single one of the controls. I mean, literally all of them. It's ones that may involve the cloud, but it may not. Like, it, you'll have controls inside SOC 2 where it's like, does, do we have security at the front door? Or is there controlled access into our buildings? Things like that. And so for the controls that you can bring in or that we can provide you the evidence for, we'll do the automated collection of that data for you. But for those other kind of controls, like the, the security at the front door, that's where we give you the capability to actually upload the evidence into the system. And so what this does is it gives you this one place that you can put all of your evidence into and then be able to export that into a, a report for your auditor, which is extremely powerful. Um, and so we're, we're really starting to see a lot of customers start to utilize Audit Manager. So the, the customizations on Audit Manager, this is, this is really um, something I'm seeing a lot of customers start doing, is you can go in and customize these frameworks. So again, like the SOC 2 example, we provide you with it, but you know, there may be some things that inside of SOC 2 that you as a business, you're not required to, to adhere to, or it may just be, not be applicable to you. So you can actually go in and remove those controls. And so that's, that's pretty powerful for you. And you can even build your own. And that's one of the things I'm running into with a lot of customers is they say, look, these, these controls and these frameworks are great, but we have our own policies and procedures that we as a company need to adhere to. Can I build that? And the answer is yes. And so now we're giving you that capability to build your own framework out. And on top of that, you can use custom controls, so you could actually build your own custom controls. Again, it could be something that's going to be automated collection, or it could be a control or a policy or procedure that you as a customer are going to be providing your manual evidence for. Um, really, really powerful piece there. 
And the, the last item in here for um, doing customization and is going to be third-party vendor risk assessments. Um, where we're seeing this be really powerful is, like, say you as a customer, you've got a, a partner or a, a vendor that you want to know how they're doing things. So then what you can do is you can build out this risk assessment questionnaire that's tailored to your organization's unique needs. And then with the custom forms through this, you can give this over to those vendors and then they can actually fill out all the data and then they're putting in the evidence for you and providing it to you. Really, really, really powerful stuff here. And now we're gonna pass it on over to Suchita and she's gonna be talking about CloudTrail. Thank you, Brad. <clears throat> Sorry. All right, so uh, let's talk about uh, AWS CloudTrail. Um, CloudTrail is a service that captures all user and API activity on your AWS account. And it enables a lot of workflows for our customers. But main use cases for CloudTrail and how customers use it is one, to provide that internal auditing capability for all of the activities that are happening in customers' AWS accounts. It is also used by the virtue of the information that it captures, which is who took an action, what was the result of the action, and what time the action was taken. It enables security monitoring and security investigation use cases. So for example, if you want to know what did a particular user do, malicious or not, at a particular time frame, CloudTrail logs will have that information for you within the realm of AWS infrastructure. Now, the other one that uh, I'm sure Todd also mentioned about is was operational troubleshooting. So developers are working on something and a particular application is not working. You're seeing a lot of throt throttling errors. All of this information would be available to you through CloudTrail logs. So it's a very, very simple thing that CloudTrail does, right? It, it's doing everything, it's tracking your user activity, and then it provides you ability to access this information and in certain cases react to this information to take action on it. So the way customers do this, there are three key ways to access CloudTrail data. The first one is event history. Event history is available to all AWS customers on by default and it provides you access to your last 90 days of management plane activity or management events. So events where a user is coming in and creating, updating, reading an AWS resource, say an S3 bucket. Everyone, all AWS customers without any uh, charge have access to this data for 90 days. Then there are requirements for customers to retain this data for a longer period of time and make it available for analysis as and when needed. So for that, customers have two options. Um, most of the customers, anyone who uses CloudTrail will be familiar with Trails. Trails is a configuration that customers create telling CloudTrail what events you want to capture and also telling CloudTrail what is the destination you want to store these events in for future retention, for log management, and providing access to your customers. Typically, um, the trails, you will have to have an S3 bucket. That is your destination. But you also have an option to add a CloudWatch logs group. And many customers do that to use CloudWatch logs in sites to analyze these logs easily or also use it as a way to send data downstream to the, uh, the same solutions. So those are a couple of ways that you can do. On Trails, uh, there is a capability called CloudTrail Insights. CloudTrail Insights will, uh, if turned on, will establish a baseline of usage activity uh, on your AWS environment. And if there is a deviation from that uh, activity, from that baseline, it will generate an insight event or basically telling you there's an anomalous activity and you can look into what's happening and what's going on. The, the one feedback that we received from our customers with using CloudTrail was the fact that once data is uh, delivered to the destination of the choice, the data is now in customer's realm. To make this data actionable, the responsibility of running the ETL on that job and making it analysis ready is something that the customers would need to do. They can establish uh, different workflows. They can use uh, Athena, that's a very common workflow, to access those logs. But before they do that, they'll also go through the ETL processing pipeline to make the, ready, make the data ready. They will also be responsible for managing the immutability of these logs. So how do you make sure that these logs are not tampered with? 
or you know, when you're taking an action on it or providing it for an auditor, CloudTrail does provide you a way to see that the logs are not tampered with, but if somebody has tampered the logs, that is something that you will have to manage on your end. So we're using the S3 policies. So the feedback that we were receiving was, you know, we want to look into CloudTrail logs. We want to take action fairly quickly because this is time sensitive. So give us an easy way to access these logs without me going through the ETL processing pipeline or spending time and effort running these analysis. So to, to solve for that particular feedback, we launched CloudTrail Lake two years ago. CloudTrail Lake is a managed data lake to aggregate, immutably store, visualize, and analyze your CloudTrail events for, to meet your audit and security analysis needs. It will capture the events just as Trail do. It will store and uh, aggregate these logs uh, in a managed storage, which AWS CloudTrail will manage for you. It will provide you dashboards to visualize this data to glean insights very quickly from this data. And then it also has a SQL interface, query interface for you to run analysis to dive deeper into your data and get answers from it. All within the realm of CloudTrail without having to move the data out of CloudTrail. So there's a bunch of solutions. One thing that this solves is something that Todd mentioned. It makes it easier for uh, users like Todd to access information, this information very quickly. It is a managed solution, so if you are uh, responsible for you know, managing the logs and making sure that they are retained properly, that heavy lifting is now done by CloudTrail. The ETL is also done by CloudTrail, and the data is ready for you to start querying as soon as it enters your event data store, which is within five minutes of creating an event data store, you will start seeing data coming in, because CloudTrail does deliver these events within five minutes of the activity taking place. And then final, it is immutable storage. Because we are managing the storage, customers, users will have read-only access to it. So if you want to analyze, you can analyze this data, but there's no way for you to change this data, modify this data, or delete this data. This is very important because when you're taking decisions based on this information, or when you're providing evidence to your auditors based on this information, you want to be sure that it has not been tampered with. So that's what it provides you out of the box, and you don't have to worry about maintaining the permissions of the S3 bucket. So now let's get into the customizations that customers are doing with CloudTrail. CloudTrail is a widely adopted service. I'm, I hope everyone is using it in one way or the other. Uh, but different customers use it in different ways. So the first customization that we have seen is the choice of destination. I alluded to it in the beginning, in the last slide. You can choose to send the, uh, using Trails to send the data to S3 bucket where you manage the ETL and you manage the retention policies of the data. Or you could also add on to it send a, a CloudWatch logs group as a destination. Or the third option is having CloudTrail Lake as a destination. What I've seen some customers do is they will have this one trail that is capturing all of this data, sending it to an uh, aggregated bucket at an organization level, but to provide access to operational troubleshooting needs, customers are using CloudTrail Lake because that's the easiest way for you to give access to the, uh, to the users who want to have, have the need to analyze this. The second one, both in <clears throat> trails and in lake, you have the ability to choose whether you want to enable logging at an organization level, in which case CloudTrail will do the work of establishing these logging pipelines across each member account in your organization and aggregate in, in the destination of your choice. Or you can also enable this data at account level. And many customers do uh, do this. They would enable trails at an account level or you know, have organization level trail and account level EDSs to meet their specific needs. Even selectors is a very interesting one and a particular kind of customizations that we have seen being asked for and used a lot in the last couple of years. Even selectors were available in CloudTrail for quite some time now. But in the last few years, we have seen customers coming to us asking how can they reduce the total volume of events that are being captured in CloudTrail, either from the point of view of cost optimization or from the point of view on reducing the noise in CloudTrail logs. So event selectors gives that opportunity to the customers, to you, to define 
what is it that is required for you to log, and what is it that is not needed and probably you don't need to log. So what these allow, for example, uh, in S3 data events, these are high volume events and something that our customers, in certain cases, really need to capture. But they have come to realize that uh, certain buckets are more important than others. So they want to know who is taking an action on a particular bucket more than they want to know who's taking action on another bucket. So event selectors allows them to give this uh, fine grain control to saying that I want to capture activity on these buckets or these names or these uh, kind of events. So you can reduce the total volume, the total cost to CloudTrail as well as downstream cost of managing, analyzing the state as the volume goes down. You can, within CloudTrail Lake, also ingest activity logs from non-AWS sources. So CloudTrail Lake will enable you to uh, log CloudTrail events, so AWS API and usage activity, configuration items, as uh, Brad mentioned, so that you can run analysis if something has changed, what are the events that are related to that. And you can also bring in events from other sources, including ISV partners, such as GitHub, uh, or your own custom application, any application that is generating audit-worthy activity logs and you have the need to have a singular place to analyze it, uh, CloudTrail Lake can be extended to those. And then finally, something that we recently launched is ability to analyze CloudTrail data in Lake using Athena. And this is really coming directly from feedback from customers. CloudTrail Lake is amazing. They use the query, but Athena is something that they use to query other data sets. And there is a need to query or correlate CloudTrail data with other data sets that they're using Athena on. So now with zero ETL, you will be able to run Athena queries on the data stored in CloudTrail Lake. So before we move forward, we wanted to bring this back and uh, ask Todd how he has been using the different services that we talked about and how does it fit into this three lines of defense model. from the three lines of defense. Oh, now we have sound good. Um, so let me dive into these. Um, so Control Tower, uh, when Arctic Wolf started building it in AWS, Control Tower wasn't a thing. Um, and so we built out our accounts, um, and then Landing Zone was launched, but you couldn't use Landing Zone in an existing organization, so we didn't use Landing Zone. Um, but we still needed to uh, manage a growing number of accounts. Um, we have requests for new accounts frequently, and we have built, uh, well, we haven't, Jake has, built a number of tools, sorry, um, that would go and help automate a lot of the work of building out these accounts. Um, some Python that was break, and you have to go back and fix things and go and keep running. It was not, a, it was not friendly, it was not, a lot of, it was not a great way to do this process. Um, and then after that, once the account was up and working, we had to go through an audit process to make sure all the security tooling had been installed properly and was running properly, that our audit jobs were running. Um, and so it would lead to multiple days of trial and error and checklists and tickets here and there to get things done. Um, but now, with the new, with the release of Control Tower, I think it was last summer, um, we can now bring our existing organization right into Control Tower and manage it. So we're doing that and using Account Factory for Terraform, or AFT. Um, we're building some customizations on top of that that are allowing us to use that AFT data as part of uh, further automation. Um, and it's made the overall management of, of the accounts and adherence to best practices a lot easier. Uh, we can go in and we can understand what accounts are there, what status they're in, what, what controls are deployed in them. And it's made things just much simpler overall for governance. Um, and it's allowing us to build, like I said, further automation on it and allowing other people to go in and look at um, our compliance status and be more familiar with it without having to come to us to ask the questions. Next up is config. Uh, we always knew we needed config. It's, it's a kind of an essential part of, of understanding your security posture, who did what, when. Um, and uh, so we'd occasionally dig into it. It was turned on, but you had to go and write queries. And when you were in a rush, because somebody did something silly and you're trying to figure out exactly how to get the thing you needed, it was frustrating. Um, we knew we wanted config to be a lot more a lot more, uh, sorry, a lot better and more useful to us, but we really couldn't figure out how, and at the time, my team was only two people. We didn't have a lot of time to spend on it. Um, so we got it working, and then we kind of left it and used it unwillingly. Um, 
But then we decided to spend some time on Security Hub, and we brought Security Hub in, we enabled the, the CIS and AWS security best practices. Um, and at the time, we really thought of Hub as a hub. We thought it was just consolidating events that were coming in from other security tools that Amazon offered us, or AWS offered us. Um, and then we realized that when you enable these features underneath the covers, it's really just turning on config rules. Um, and so we got away from having to manage the config rules ourselves and writing them ourselves and manage them, um, because Security Hub just did that for us. Um, so since we had all that, and we had the data now coming into a single spot that, was, that had great APIs and integration with EventBridge and Lambdas, we've now built enrichment systems on top, of the, uh, on top of that data. So we can go out and grab tagging information, which is now actually a default feature as a reInvent. So it automatically enriches the security data. We can remove that automation. But it um, brings contextual information into the security event so that when we process them further down the line, we can say, based on these tags, this S3 bucket belongs to this team. We can open a JIRA ticket for that team to go and remediate uh, whatever the finding was. Um, and now we brought the config data into uh, CloudTrail Lake as well, um, so we can um, we can use that data through the same interface. But we can also give that data to other teams more readily as well. So our other security organizations, they can go in there and they can do research without having to bother my team or be engaged with my team at all. I think I tapped that twice. Oh, maybe not. Um, Systems Manager. Um, we use Systems Manager kind of sparingly right now, but not out of an unwillingness, just out of a, out of a lack of time to, to focus on it. But we do have Fleet Manager um, running, and we're using it regularly. Um, Inventory Manager has come up and been really useful to us. Um, we actually we had an incident a little while ago where we didn't have really good um, information about what was running where. We didn't know which packages were installed on certain hosts. Um, and one of uh, the members of my team went out and just bashed together everything we needed in CloudFormation to turn on centralized uh, inventory management. And it's become really, really useful to us as we go through the effort of trying to find you know, which packages do we need to update across all these you know, thousands of nodes that are coming and going throughout, throughout the day. Uh, so SSM inventory has been great for us and it was really easy to get going. Um, we're also ramping up our use of connection manager. So we see a lot of value in SSM. I think there's a lot that we can do with it. Um, and working alongside our infrastructure teams, um, we're gonna be rolling this out more frequently and using it more frequently. So CloudTrail, like Config, we, we kind of identified as a foundational service. You have to have it. It's really useful. It provides a lot of useful information. Um, but at the time that I kind of inherited CloudTrail, it was awkward to use. We were logging to a bucket, and then we'd set up replication into uh, the Control Tower audit account, even though it wasn't really Control Tower at that point. Uh, we kind of followed the right structure, and we had it in there. We had keys set up so that you could only read and write uh, through, through this. Um, so when we needed to use the data, it was awkward. I would have to go and do a AWS S3 CP or sync down on my laptop and wait for hours while it pulled it down over my home Wi-Fi connection. And then I would grep and and said what I needed out of it. Um, and it was not friendly. We didn't use it unless we had to. If there was no other way to find the same information and we were desperate, we would go in and use it. Um, we would, but otherwise we just left it and tried to find other ways to do things. So we realized, a year ago, that that was just not gonna work two years ago, actually, now, wow, time's flown by, um, that we really needed a better solution for this. So we started looking into using Firehose to ingest the CloudTrail uh, data into OpenSearch, building Kibana dashboard and stuff like that. We looked at how to scale up the ES clusters or the OpenSearch clusters. We looked at how to build Firehose out and make that work globally. Uh, we got kind of it all working, but it was starting to look really complicated and expensive. We're still a very small team, just two of us at the point, and we really didn't want to get into the world of running Elasticsearch clusters. Um, but that was what we had to do until, Happily, right after we managed to get all the design and stuff done, we were ready to launch, CloudTrail Lake was launched. Um, we had all the benefits of CloudTrail, so it gives us all the same data, but it solved our analysis piece, it solved our aggregation piece, it solved our ingest piece. We didn't have to worry about any of that. We go in, you create an EDS, and it starts ingesting data from your organization, and you can immediately start searching it. So it was, it was night and day for us. We didn't have to get into managing Elasticsearch, which, I mean, most of you probably have touched it and realized it's not fun. Um, so we got some great wins. Uh, we have our security operations wins, obviously. We know to investigate security problems, understand who is doing what and when. Um, we have least privileged benefits now. We can go in and we can understand what services and what uh, features our, our teams are using or what they're not using and help us pare that down. Uh, we can also use it when we're trying to build least privileged and we say, okay, we've given you this access. Can you go try that thing that you're trying to make work? Especially if you're trying to deal with Athena and Glue and things like that. There's a lot of little nuanced access permissions you need with that. Um, so we go back and forth and we want watch CloudTrail for that. Uh, we also have operational data that's been really great. Uh, so Cheetah mentioned rate limiting. The first day, like literally the day we launched CloudTrail Lake, because we're sitting there refreshing, waiting for the first day to start coming in, there was an incident um, around Route 53. We couldn't make updates quickly enough because we use the API a lot. Um, and we were getting behind on some of the updates on that. And so we were looking at CloudTrail and, and 
evaluating what was there, and we realized that the rate limiting messages were right in there. There's errors you could go find. So we quickly built a query to find what it was that was causing the rate limiting. We found a lambda that was going a little too fast, um, and we were able to pass that information back to the operations team in order to solve that incident r relatively quickly. So it immediately made an impact on us uh, from the operational and the security perspective. Um, so now we really use CloudTrail Lake every day. Um, I've spent four hours in CloudTrail Lake on Friday doing reporting and things like that on data access and, and analysis and try to do even cost analysis uh, by understanding what the data is and how frequent it is. We can also do cost analysis to work with our COGS team. So um, we use it a lot and we're also now able to give that to other people. We can say to the service teams, hey, you're having problems, can you go look in CloudTrail Lake, um, tell us what the errors are and give me the, uh, the updated, like a, make a PR uh, with the new permissions that you need for access to fix that problem. We can also give to our security operations teams and our AppSec teams, they can go in and look at things as well. So it's really, it's, it's helped spread the resources on my team out to other teams and made the data more available. Um, and on top of that, now we're working on ways to build automated reports um, off of CloudTrail Lake. And I think um, with the uh, addition of Athena this week, I was hooray for that because I think now we can start building uh, using uh, QuickSight and other tools to go build reports and analysis off the CloudTrail Lake data very easily. We don't need to go and build our own frameworks on it. So um, we've done some customizations around that and we were planning on more and now we have to kind of reevaluate and that's the nature of reInvent. <laughs> Um, so finally, talking about um, Security Lake. So Security Lake is, um, it's a bit of a, com I don't want to say competitive, it's a bit of a parallel track when it comes to uh, CloudTrail Lake and other security things. And we're, we're, we're really trying to figure out where we're going to use one over the other. We've turned on Security Lake, we're ingesting data into it, we're working on integrations with it. Um, but the way we're focusing on it is that CloudTrail Lake is going to be our kind of our uppercase audit store, uppercase A audit store, where we're going to keep things that are immutable, that we know we have to be time bound. Uh, we can restrict access to it. We don't have to worry that the data is going to get munged somehow or someone's going to do something bad. It's untouchable. Um, and so we're going to use CloudTrail Lake for that. And then we're going to use Security Lake for more of the, the building smaller, like sub, smaller tables, working with lake formation, um, enabling our users to build integrations, uh, feeding into uh, third parties and things like that. Um, so that they can do the work and do some of the joins and relationships. Now, again, the addition of Athena to CloudTrail Lake, um, I think is gonna make, maybe change the picture and we have to reevaluate how this is gonna work and how we're gonna customize our solution in this space because it's, again, not competitive, but there's options. And like many things in AWS, there's four or five ways to do things um, and you gotta figure out which one works best for your organization. So um, the nice thing with, moving, with, with bringing up Security Lake is because it's cross-functional for us, um, and multiple people want to use it and there's lots of data, it's helping drive some maturity in our organization because it's making us ask questions about what it means, what ownership means. Who, if we want to assign a ticket to somebody, how do we understand who owns that thing? What does ownership mean? Is it the person who wrote the code that deployed it? Is it the person who deployed it? Or is it the service that's running it? So some of these things are, by doing this work, it's really helping us drive some better governance and better processes through our organization as well. So the use of data is not just solving you know, data problems and security problems, but it's also helping build our organization a lot better. So, um, everything's working really well. All these tools are coming together and the team is able to work really well, but like any good customer, now I want it all cheaper. Over to Brad. Yeah, so um, that's really been the focus of a lot of us this year. And a lot of customers have been trying to um, run things very cost effectively. And so here at AWS, you know, we, we've heard you and a lot of the things that we've actually released this year have been focused on that. And so um, a couple of the items I kind of want to talk about here, we're going to focus really on config and CloudTrail because if you're, you're running them, they may be the ones that you're, you're familiar with um, and potentially having a little bit of higher costs depending on how you've got them set up. And so back at Reinforce, what we launched is the capability to exclude by resource type. And where this is extremely powerful to you as a customer, and how it helps you customize to, to cost optimize will be around, for example, you can go into CloudWatch and now look for which, we have a metric that's published there now, and it'll show you which CIs are costing you the most. And so you as a business can decide, do I really need you know, X, Y, and Z resource types to meet my compliance framework or my regula regulatory requirements that we, we need to adhere to? And you know, if it's, if it's a, a high volume one and it's one that you don't need, we've now given you a really easy way to just turn it off. And so instead of being an inclusion list, now it's an exclusion list. Really makes it just a whole lot simpler. And I've seen where a lot of customers, for example, Todd was able to utilize this. Um, to, he turned off, I think it was resource compliance was one of the ones he turned off. But they actually, through this, were able to save 25% on their config bill. 
And so, you know, again, it's, it's going in, it's identifying a resource type that may not have business value and then getting it turned off. And so very, very powerful um, piece in there. And um, we've got a blog and everything, I think, at the end that we'll, we'll share that shows you how you can identify those items. And by all means, if um, you, know, you need help, let us know. That's, that's what my role is here for. It's one of those things that through your account team, you can reach out and I'll jump in and help you on that. Um, here at reInvent, we just launched what is called periodic recording. And so this is, a, this is an interesting release. Uh, we had some customers that they were looking more for just an audit capability, not for continuous compliance. And so what this does for you now is you can go per account, per region, per resource type, and select daily recording instead of continuous. And so where I can see this kind of coming into play would be for customers if they've got an account that let's say it's spinning up tons of EKS and ECS, but they, they really don't want or care about, say, all the EC2 instances that are being spun up over the day. They just want the overall. And so they could just have EC2 set up as a 24-hour. Then if anything's running at that 24-hour time period, then it'll, it, you'll get a resource type for that. Anything that's spinning up in between, you're not going to. So this is not, a, you know, it's, it's definitely not going to be something that if you are trying to adhere to risk uh, or if you're very risk adverse, you're not going to want to use this particular feature for it. But you know there are some specific accounts and specific workloads that this will work for. So I definitely recommend you check it out. Um, you know it's, it's it is priced a little bit differently, but we do see that it's going to help reduce uh, builds on real high churn type areas. And on CloudTrail. All right. Um, awesome. So. On the same vein, I think I spoke about this when we were talking about the customizations. But even selectors, I, I do want to talk about it again, and we'll look into demos on how you can enable it. Even selector is really a very good tool for you to use to reduce the number of events that you're capturing. If you have the need to capture data events, they are high volume events. And the event selectors can really help you bring the total volume down. Uh, I would just say that when you're applying event selectors on your trails or on your event data store, do get a confirmation from the central security team and make sure that you uh, are okay excluding those resources or excluding those event types. Uh, but there are certain customers who were able to, you know, they were capturing, as I said, all S3 buckets in their organizations, and that was too cost prohibitive. They went back to their central team and they identified 20 buckets that they really wanted to capture and react to the information. So they were able to really bring down their cloud trail uh, data events cost um, down. So event selectors are available both on management events as well as data events. On data events, you do have more granularity on what you can select. So I'll show this uh, quickly in the demo. It's not a new tool, but if you are looking for cost optimization, this is one thing that you can right away jump into and see um, if you can reduce the volume of the events that you're capturing. And as I said, like it's not just cloud trail uh, cost that will bring down. Uh, customers typically do have the need to send this data downstream to uh, you know, their SIEM solutions or their analytical solutions, and moving the data is expensive as well. So that portion of your total bill would also be impacted by uh, using event selectors. All right, so something that we recently launched, uh, CloudTrail Lake uh, has been a great uh, tool. It has been used by a lot of customers since it's launched, uh, but it was priced on certain elements. One was it is priced if you use more, it's volume tiered. So if you use more, you'll pay less overall. Um, and then it does come with seven years of retention included for it to become that audit store. So that was how it was packaged when we launched, and that's how it has been up till recently. One of the consistent feedback that we were receiving from customers who did not have the need to store the data for up to seven years are the customers who did not have usage enough to move them to higher tiers was that it is extremely expensive for them to get started with CloudTrail Lake at the price point that we had. So to meet the needs of these customers, we have launched a new pricing packaging uh, option where you will be able to select um, pricing in a way that you, the data will be ingested and available to you for you to use without any additional charges for one year 
so lower retention. And you can add, if you have the need, you can add more uh, time and there'd be additional pay charge on that. But if your usage is under 25 TB of data, and you don't have the retention requirements of seven years, this option will be extremely, extremely cost efficient as compared to what you have today with CloudTrail Lake. Um, CloudTrail Lake overall, either this option or the seven year retention is a great, great tool if you have the need of uh, providing data to, let's say, different personas in your organization, and you do not want to create multiple trails. So CloudTrail Lake will provide you that cost-effective solution for that as well, and then the new pricing brings it down further uh, so that you can start uh, immediately using this at a lower cost. Um, as I said, first year of retention is included, so you can log it, come back to it, access this data, query it anytime you want. Uh, there are customers that had come back to us and said that seven years of retention was not good enough for them to meet their requirements. So this lake pricing also enables you to keep your logs up to 10 years if that's what uh, is needed in your compliance. So really, really excited about this. Uh, we are hoping that more customers will find value and uh, you know, start using CloudTrail Lake and be able to access their logs uh, faster. We've talked about this multiple times, Todd talked about it. This is a new release that happened two days ago. Uh, again, uh, coming directly from the feedback from customers. Uh, we talked about it. Now you can use Amazon Athena queries directly on CloudTrail Lake data. Uh, and you don't have to do any ETL. That process will be taken care of again by CloudTrail, so you don't have to take up that additional operational cost of establishing an ETL solution. Uh, this, once you enable, we are calling it uh, query federation, once you enable this, CloudTrail will create a managed database in Glue catalog and make it available in lake formation. So you can do uh, permissioning over there and give access to Athena. You can also use this to build quick site dashboards if that's what you're looking to do. All right, uh, in terms of new launches, not directly related to cost savings in this particular case, but uh, I mentioned that CloudTrail Insights was up until recently only available to Trail customers. So if CloudTrail Lake customers had the need for CloudTrail to identify and let them know about anomalous activity, this capability was not there. Two weeks ago, we extended CloudTrail Insights into CloudTrail Lake. So now you will have the ability to identify if there's an anomalous behavior happening in your AWS environment. And you'll also be able to analyze and do root cause analysis of this Insights event happened. What are the other events that could have led to this anomalous behavior? So all you can do within um, the contract construct of CloudTrail. Um, I'll quickly go into the demo. Uh, let me see. Um, but I, I, Let's see if I can show you exactly how these options look in our console. So what I'm gonna do in this demo is I'm gonna walk you through creating an EDS and walk you through the different configurations that we talked about. Um, so the first thing, I'm here in CloudTrail console. I'm gonna go, the first thing, if you're starting to use CloudTrail Lake, you will basically create an event data store. Event data store is the construct that will hold all of the data that you will capture or ask CloudTrail to capture. So for here, you'll come over here, create an event data store, give it a name, and this is where you'll make your first choice. Again, if you do not have the need to retain this data for seven years, or if you want to try it and you don't have high usage, go with this new pricing. It'll be one flat pricing and really cost efficient. So I'm gonna choose that one year extendable retention. Uh, you can change the retention period, but one year is included within the uh, ingest chart, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, you have the options to choose your encryption type. So by default, AWS CloudTrail will encrypt data in Lake using AWS Managed Key, but you can also do uh, using Customer Managed Key. Now, if you have the need for accessing this data using uh, Athena, this is what you will turn on. You will basically say enable Lake Query Federation. And once you do that, what CloudTrail Lake will do is, as I said, it will create a managed database in Glue catalog, make it available in Lake Formation, where you can do all of the IAM permissioning that will allow users with the right permission to access this data using Athena. So that will be done for you. 
And then you will go and choose the type of events you want to capture. Um, as I said, in CloudTrail Lake, it does extend to non-AWS events. If that is your need, you can uh, create an EDS for non-AWS events, including some of these partners, if you have, if you use them. Or if you have a custom application that is producing audit-worthy logs, you can bring it over here. So let's quickly go into CloudTrail events. Uh, I want to focus on the data uh, event selectors. So the first option that you'll have over here is management events. Within management events, you don't, typically what I've seen is customers don't filter management events out a lot because they are low volume events and they're mostly required for compliance and auditing as well. Um, now, one thing that I've seen customers do specifically in cases where they have multiple personas or multiple copies of data, one thing that I've seen them do is not include read events. So they only care about mutating events, and this will bring down the total volume considerably. Uh, we've also been uh, reached out we, by customers, and AWS KMS APIs, they are, and RDS APIs, they are like one uh, set of management events that can get voluminous. So now over here, uh, you have the ability to exclude these high voluminous events if that's what you need to do and your central security team is open to that. So you can do that. Um, and then in management event, uh, let's look at S3. So as I said, in, man in data events, you do have finer controls on what you want to log. Um, and that really helps you figure out what is important to you. What is it that you place value in tracking. And there are three ways you can do that. You can do it by resource earn. So if you choose resource earn, you can say, you know, log only for resources that equals this, or log only for resources where the earn starts with or ends with or does not start or ends with this particular phrase. Um, and then it will apply those filters, uh, reducing the um, volume. Uh, read only is another one. You can do read only equals false. Um, and then event name, this is, this is an interesting one because specifically when customers are using for security monitoring use case, I have seen customers use this selector and choose to log any destructive events as they describe it. So like if an object is being deleted, that is of importance to them. So they would basically say, log this event name when it is delete object, for example. So you'll, you'll have that filtering capability, that fine grained control on deciding what to log and what to pay for. Moving on, uh, if you create this, this EDS will be created, but I'm gonna quickly show you what the dashboard looks like. So CloudTrail Lake comes with a set of curated visualizations, uh, dashboards, to get you started in gleaning insights out of this data. These are initial sets of widgets that we created based on feedback from customers as to like why do they come in, why do they look at the data for CloudTrail. So for example, you can see what are the top errors, you can see what are the most active regions, you can see top users. And in many cases, these will be enough for you to like, quickly answer a question from an audit request or a security investigation. But if you want to dig deeper, uh, I quickly moved, but under every widget, there is a link for you to actually dig deeper if you want. You can go and go to query editor and the query would be populated over here and then you can very quickly edit this query uh, and make it work for you, make it work for your specific use case and you run this query and you'll get the answer, the data back in tabular format for you to uh, further analyze it. So that was my demo. We do wanna cover uh, config a little bit. Yeah, I'll just show real quick. Um, so the, the new options that we were talking about earlier inside of config. So inside of here, if you go into settings, because she already has one set up. So here's the, the new section that we've added. So the default setting is, is gonna be continuous recording, because that, that's honestly what I think most customers will do. However, we do now have the option to do daily. But now here's the new area. So this is gonna be the overrides. And so what you'll be able to do inside of here is, let's say you wanted to, you know, change EC2 instance, and you wanted to override that to say daily recording. This is where you'll be able to go in and configure that. And so you'll see down here, uh, it gives you the, the limits on how many you can do, but um, you know, you just literally keep adding into here. And, um, and so um, 
so yeah, so in here it's, it's literally, it's just a, a pretty simple system, uh, pretty self-explanatory where you'd go in and set that. Um, same thing would go where if you wanted to do the exclude by recording, this is the new way, this is actually changed this on Sunday. Um, so again, if you want to do an exclude for a resource type, like say, if you made a business decision that managed instance inventory wasn't something you wanted to have inside of config, it, it can be very um, high volume. If you're not using it, then that may be one that you wanted to go in and exclude. So you just hit exclude and update by hitting save, and that's really it. It's quite simple to do. Um, so yeah, so that covers those portions there, and with that, throw up a, a couple little resource things. Um, so yeah, on here we've, we've got the, the items on um, the resource exclusion. That's actually a blog that'll give you the details on um, how to do the CloudWatch metrics I was talking about. We even give you the little um, line of code that'll make it nice and easy for you. Um, we've got a blog that um, Todd actually wrote last year on how they utilize CloudTrail Lake. So um, pretty, pretty interesting. It, it dives a lot more into what they use it for. Um, and, uh, and lastly, customizing config tracking um, uh, on Control Tower. That one's really important for if you are a Control Tower customer and you want to make changes to the recorder, um, like say resource exclusion, that's not supported currently inside a Control Tower, so this blog tells you how to do that. So if that's something you want to customize, definitely check that blog out and, um, until we can get that added into Control Tower. But um, with that, uh, thank you everybody, and we'll be